Hey everybody, my name's Garrett and I play Martin in Army of the Dead. I hope you're enjoying Justice Con. I wish I could be there with you. I can't wait to share this film with you when it comes out next month. Me and you, we're going to go Valentine hunting. What do you say? You're not ready. You're not ready. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And we're back. Day three, Justice Con. We're closing out the convention. I am your host, Tim Yoko. And I'm your other host, Scott McClellan, and we are from Squadcast Media, here with our spotlight panel for Army of the Dead with Mr. Zack Snyder. Mr. S Zach, Zach yeah. I guess I got to just call you Zach at this point. I mean, yeah. thank yeah, you so fine. much for your time. <laughs> thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Honestly, really good. Uh, glad to be here. And uh, always, uh, this has um, been so far a really fun event, and I'm uh, excited about what everyone had to say. Awesome. Okay. Well, we're just going to go ahead and jump into it because, I mean, Army of the Dead is like almost a month away at this point. And the first thing we wanted to ask was, so it's been 17 years since Dawn of the Dead. Mm -hmm. What was the thought process between now being the time to come back to the zombie genre? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it was, um, I don't think uh, I thought about it in those terms of like, okay, let's go back to zombies because that's where we started. I mean, it's cool and serendipitous and I like the way it's worked out and it's been, you know, um, oddly feel scripted but um and maybe that's just the way the world works uh i hope so but um yeah no it just felt right and um i loved uh my partners at netflix have been amazing and uh, they let us make this crazy movie and uh we had such a fun time doing it so i guess really it's been an amazing opportunity and i and i i'm i'm blessed for that and uh, as far as it's um, sort of career design, sure. In retrospect, yes. But I mean, I don't think we, we, we didn't really think about it quite as dramatically as that, you know, but it, it's, as I say, it's, it's worked out really well. Now, now you've said that uh, this doesn't really have any uh, connections to um, Dawn of the Dead. Was that part of the consideration at the time? Or is this something that you maybe even considered at one point in time just connecting? Or you just decided it's best to just kind of leave this as a separate entity? You mean as far as the actual, just the project itself and how it exists? Yeah. Well, the, the world of Army of the Dead. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I guess the way it worked out was that, like, after I did um, Dawn, I had... Uh, gone on this sort of exploration into genre and kind of thought about like the tropes. It really got me thinking about tropes and about how the sort of, you know, like a postmodern kind of look at what is reflexive cinema? What is it when we are self-aware that we're watching a movie and the movie has rules that sort of come from the genre that it mm -hmm. is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a fun game that you can play with yourself as far as, yeah. um, the language of cinema and how we perceive it and the and, and, and to some extent there's sort of the rules that we impose on ourselves to you know when you're rendering a world or within a world and, and say and I, and in this case there's the zombie genre because now it's its own genre i think mm -hmm. you can say yeah um like what are the rules like what are the tropes what are the the sort of conditions and, and I think that when I was making Dawn, I kind of was thinking, of, it really got me spun out on that whole, um, on tone mm -hmm. and on this notion that you can, and, I, and I've said this a bunch of times, but that you can, you can, you can have fun, but not make fun. You know, mm -hmm. you can take the audience to the edge uh, of breaking it. But yeah. if you break it, the, the problem is, of course, you know, it's hard to get them back. And that is to say to, to a place where they believe that the characters are in jeopardy or that there's real, that, that there's real stakes. These are, these are the, the problems with, and sort of the challenges with pushing the, that concept. Mm -hmm. And so while I was sort of, you know, musing over those, 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 the rules of, of genre um, and kind of enjoying that, that process. I, 
I just started thinking about like, okay, if that was the sort of, if, if that exercise was the, at the heart of the why, what would, what would it do? What would it do to the movie? And I think that's kind of where I, that's kind of how army was born mm -hmm. then. And that is to say, I was just trying to construct a scenario that would be, um, that would, that would fuel that, the notion of a, um, of a, of a, of a, of a cinema trope, tropey, troping, mm -hmm. that's all trope. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And so that was just how I started to play with scenarios and like, even just like nuking the site and the time, the, the time, the clock, ticking clock and all the MacGuffins and like the other, you know, whether it be um, Planet of the Apes or Alien or whatever, all the other little like Escape from New York, you know, all the yeah. kind of other reference, not to mention just zombie movies in general or Romero movies more specifically. But, um, you know, and then a heist genre movie on top of that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and then we, and, and gathering the team and like just all of that stuff that in a lot of ways, it's well, it's it's well um, walked uh, territory, but I just really felt like it was super fun to make a movie that is that movie that is aware that it's that movie without trying to break it completely, mm. but but not, but but still keeping in mind and always hitting the audience with that next thing that's within the concept kind of has to happen, but hiding it and kind of disguising it so that it's still acts still a surprise. Mm -hmm. and you're still like, um, in a lot of ways, it's like, it's like Valentine, the zombie tiger, mm -hmm. you know? And, and when I was talking to Grace and she said that like, of course there's a zombie tiger, <laughs> but <That's awesome. laughs> it's incredibly obvious until yeah. it, until it is obvious, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, it, nobody would think of a zombie tiger until you see the zombie tiger and you're like, of course there's a zombie tiger. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that, I think that's like, that's a, a metaphor for how the movie, you know, mm -hmm. kind of exists, you know, as yeah. this, and it really was fun to make. And, and these guys like Dave did an incredible job um, because within their reality, they don't have to think about any of that. And to mm -hmm. them, it's, you know, the the drama and the the the, the character arc that, and the journey that they're on is one hundred percent stone cold real. And you know, I have to have sort of that thousand foot view to be able to kind of move the pieces around correctly, so that you know they're always getting caught out, or that the thing that you know is going to happen happens, but happens in a way that you're like, Oh fuck, I didn't see it. I didn't know it was going to be like that. And did you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, sorry. And to go full circle. Um, I, and so I had done that work and sort of developed this thing. And it was all the stuff that's in the movie, you know, like Vegas and building the wall and mm -hmm. the zombies are inside and hiring this, like, um, uh, you know, like a, um, a group of zombie hunters, that and, and it's and it's a it's a post-war movie right like it's mm -hmm. these are all veterans of a war mm -hmm. everyone has their own experiences but we jump that you know to say like okay now we're going to assume that they all saw and committed atrocities of their own mm -hmm. you know creation um and they're all kind of like you know ptsd a little bit and mm -hmm. you know they're they all have trauma um and then, and then take those guys, obviously, to to do one last mission, you know, one last, mm -hmm. let's get the money, you know, yeah. and like retire, we'll never have to do it, you know, of course. Um, and, so, yeah. and so that's how it existed for me. And then we, um, you know, we wrote a script um, and we were gonna do it and couldn't get enough money. And I wasn't gonna direct it at the time. And then when it came back around, um, uh, it just, uh, 
I just mentioned it, you know, it was like one of those things I had in my mind, you know, maybe I'll do, maybe I'll do army. Mm -hmm. um, and just everything fell together really, really quickly, actually. <laughs> With the with the idea you're talking about the knowing the rules, making the rules, breaking the rules, the Russian nesting doll of tropes. Mm -hmm. uh, you had talked about, but previously about how you and Shay Hatton had come up with a zombie bible. Like, okay, we need our zombies, we need our world to operate by a certain set of rules because you know, fictionally, you make mm -hmm. the rules so that you know what you can and cannot do. Of course, mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious. Is that something that is that something that you're keeping just internally is that something that's in the script is that something that might be released or published later on like just to kind of see like the notes of the show bible as it were i mean at some point i think that once you see the animated series um the animated series in a lot of ways is like a primer for the bible it kind of tells okay, okay. it kind of takes you through the why of everything you know mm. okay. and it, and i think that that in a kind of a fun way and mm. you know and Joe is, Magnello is the, he's kind of the lead of the animated series. He okay. plays. So it's just funny that he's, you know, yeah. they're all, this whole group is pretty much, you know, yeah. we keep using them over and over, but in a good way. Um, I love doing that, by the way. And so, um, yeah. And so um, I would say that we're not, it's not like we're hiding those rules or anything. Like we like, we, we like our rules and they're very specific. Um, but yeah. So it's fun. Did, did you, um, you know, did you take any consideration, like, you know, based on some of your past films, um, you, you know, you've always tried to push like storylines and themes that haven't always been like readily accepted by, you know, critics and the general audience and all that. But I mean, like we've personally just love that kind of stuff. Like, you know, we want challenging story making. And uh, have you found yourself adjusting, you know, based on some of those past critiques and all that not really i don't think so i mean i think that it's i found it to be the opposite um yeah. and we talked about it the other day this notion that the um i feel like the sort of the hardcore fan base has grown mm -hmm. um and i think that they and i think with justice league um as sort of rosetta stone Mm -hmm. to the other movies um acting as a kind of a way to look at them again um and have people go oh wow i didn't you know that's interesting mm -hmm. like they meant that i guess mm -hmm. um <laughs> you know i think that that that's been a that's been an interesting thing and, and i think that um yeah i mean i've i've never really changed how i do it um but it's been, uh, you know, and it, look, and we faced the huge challenges, like the whole everything, everything having to do with Justice League is a byproduct mm -hmm. of us kind of not, mm -hmm. you know, kind of just doing it one way that we think is right. the cool way. And but I don't think anybody really wants the version of the movie where you simply do as you're told and yeah. and you know, the committee wins. Like, I mean, right. this, like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't think, I don't think, I might be wrong, but I just don't think that's the way that the people, it makes the experience, it goes back to what I was saying. I mean, it is interesting when, in, in, in terms of, when you look at ARMY in, in the full relationship, ARMY is, uh, definitely deconstructs this genre 100%. Awesome. But it does not, um, violate sort of the oath that you take to the movie to deliver the drama of the movie. And, and like, I have no desire to, to break it. Right. Mm -hmm. I want, I want at the end, you go like, Holy, like what happened? Like Jesus, like, the, like, I can't believe like, it was that insane, that intense. Mm -hmm. And like, you don't get that reaction if you if you deconstruct it so far that the threats go away, right? Mm -hmm. Right. It's really, I think, the opposite. It's additive. Because I would say in the context of the zombie genre, 
zombies have been, you know, they're very, they're in the vernacular. They're very much, mm -hmm. we know what they can and can't do. And, mm -hmm. and so they, you know, we've evolved a lot of zombies and zombie films now have evolved to the point where the obvious threat is the humans within mm -hmm. the zombie world. Mm -hmm. Right. The zombies represent this sort of like constant, like a mudslide or like a, you know, like some sort of act of nature that's coming to destroy you. And then how you react to that is sort of a study in human psychology. Mm -hmm. And like you either kill your buddy and take his water or you, you know, whatever, you know, all the things, the new, the sort of revealing, uh, you know, man as, you know, his true nature zombies help us see ourselves right that's kind of that's kind of the main i'd say the main focus of the genre is to hold a mirror up to us and use the zombies as the sort of um equalizer that mm -hmm. cuts through everything and separates you into your true nature you know nice. and whether you're a good guy or a bad guy it is revealed in the face of, you know, famously, and I think in the case, even in the case of all my characters in Army, they had normal lives before they were, like Scott's character, Scott, who, uh, Dave Bautista's character, Scott, you know, he had a taco truck and he was a short order cook, right? Mm -hmm. And then the zombie play comes to like, wasn't he a special forces, like, you know, operative? No, he was, he was, he was a, you know, short order cook who picked up a gun and happened to be good at killing zombies. It's not, uh, you know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. I, I like that. I personally like that, you know, mm -hmm. like we see, like, you know, the, when we see, you'll see in the title sequence, there's like, it tracks the the different characters, kind of some of, some of the characters. And I do this little kind of stylized trope where they're like, against this backdrop holding a picture like sprayed with blood or whatever. And they're holding pictures from their old lives of who they were. Oh, you know? I like that. And it just kind of like, you know, like for instance, Amari's is him graduating from college with a degree in philosophy. You know, it's just him at his graduation, you know? And the shot before that, he's like sawing a guy in half with his chin, with his, <laughs> you know. So it's like, it, it like that to me is like, that's, so that's a kind of classic. And, and I would say that that title sequence is, is to me, that was my homage to sort of how you, what is the, what is the classic zombie apocalypse end or fall of mankind due to the normal person, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Either rise or fall, depending right. on how. And then what the movie does at, after that, and we start actually the story of the film, is it makes, I had this idea that if it was possible that you could, that you could sympathize with the zombies or that like any bad guy in a movie is not the bad guy to them, right? Like they're, whatever they're doing is like, I'm just trying to restore order to the universe. Like if you're Darth Vader or whatever, um, you know, like I'm, like, I'm not, I'm not necessarily bad, you know, I'm just, these people are crazy. They need to be, I need to, I need to help them, um, you know? So, I really felt like one of a cool thing if I could do it would be to sort of create and evolve zombies to the point where you would look at them that they could from a certain point of view like is there would there be team zombie like t-shirts like team Zeus right. right you know like if you watched army you finished it, you'd be like I wanted Zeus to win you know the the <laughs> alpha like the Richard Trunks character is Zeus mm -hmm. right yeah you're like, I want Zeus to win. Like, I want, I want the queen, I want he and the queen to have like whatever their crazy zombie life is together. I don't want, I don't want the humans are crap. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so um, 
I want, I wanted like, and I think any good monster movie or any good, um, you know, uh, genre film that includes some sort of, whether it be an alien or a monster or a zombie, if you can get on a little bit, see it from their side, then suddenly, you know, the whole thing is, is, is whacked in a great way. And so that's, that was like the big, that was the, to me like the big challenge. Now that we've sort of established in my mind, once I had established this zombie universe that we were like, okay, look, this is the world we live in. This is zombie infested Vegas. This is the sort of the why of where it came from. Not a hundred percent clear, but enough so that you're like, okay, clearly there's a, enough for there to be the fall of Vegas. Let's call it that. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and it was from there that like, you know, I, I had to begin this, this, this other experiment and it really, and it really, I, I, I'm really happy with it. And I think that that's what I mean by, so we were able to deconstruct this, this sort of the zombie tropes, but reconstruct them in another way. That's not entirely inconsistent, but enough that allows this kind of, you know, they're not what you think they are. You know, there's that, Nora has that line in the, you know, <laughs> you know, they're smarter, they're, they're organized, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, That's all they have to be. It only has to be those three things, right? right. Smarter, faster, organized, and suddenly all bets are off. Right. Because <laughs> like, the old, all the other things you would have done to fight a zombie, no longer, there's one, this isn't a spoiler, but there's one sequence near the beginning of the film where a guy is trying to shoot at an alpha. Cause like there's sort of different tiers of mm -hmm. zombies. We have mm -hmm. like alphas and shamblers, right? Mm -hmm. So this, this soldier's trying to shoot at this alpha and he's like, like <laughs> he, yeah. you know, he's like running at him, but he's not running straight at him. And he's like, you know, if you shoot him in the body, he's not going to stop. Yeah. Right. And it's just like, you realize how hard it would be to actually, if like, under duress with this scary, super strong, super fast thing coming at you that you, you know, you could see how if you were going to fight these alphas, how hard it would be. And I just think that it right away, you realize like, okay, everyone's in trouble. Like, you know, this is not, this is not going to be, this isn't easy. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's worse than I thought, but I think that that, it, it makes it just fun. You know, I think it just really makes it fun. You have had an opportunity a lot to talk about your work as a director and more recently as, you know, your own DP on the film. But this does mark your second original screenplay after Sucker Punch. And mm -hmm. so I was hoping that you could talk about, like, what is it like Zack Snyder, the writer? Like, what mm -hmm. is that process for you or what goes into you, you writing your own screenplays? Well, I guess it's like I have, um, <clears throat> by the way, and Shay's a great partner. Shay was amazing. Mm -hmm. I really like working with him. But I, I mean, I got to say, like, I have, you know, almost every movie I've worked on, you know, I've done a bunch of writing on all the movies, mm -hmm. you know. It's not like, um, yes, Sucker Punch. And I wrote that with Steve. And that was like our first thing that wasn't based on an IP or anything, but even up to that point, I had, you know, always been like, okay, this scene, let me just work on it. And then now here, try this. Um, so it wasn't, it's not a thing that I was uncomfortable with, you know, it, it's, I'm, I was always writing from when I was, you know, uh, you know, uh, pretty young, you know, in, in, in 11 years old, I was like, okay, here's a movie idea, you know, um, which is good, I'm sure. And then everybody does that, by the way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to some extent. And so, you know, I guess for me, the writing process is just, I, I feel like I never have not been doing it. So it's, it's I, I know to the world, it seems like, oh, Zach wrote this, that's weird. Um, but to me, it, it just feels really just, you know, just real natural and, 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 and basically um, kind of how I look at movies anyway. <laughs> Um, and I love the collaboration and it just happened to be that Shay and I wrote it all by our, you know, we, we just did it from scratch. 
where like, you know, something like working with Chris and like I say to Chris, like, and Chris is a genius. And I'll be like, Chris, I'm gonna have Flash run time back. You know, at the, like the mother box is gonna, they're gonna lose. And he'd be like, I don't think that's gonna work. I don't think that's gonna work. He talked about it yesterday. Yeah. I don't think that's gonna work. And I'm like, okay, well trust me, this is how I wanna do it. And then, you know, and then he's like, okay, good, go for it. Like, you know, we'll see, we'll see, how, see how it looks. <laughs> um, but I think that I have that kind of relationship with the writers I've worked with where like right. they, they know that I have a really specific way of, of, of seeing. And, and so if it, it feels natural to me to, to write, although, and, and I've, you know, it, I've written a, a lot, you know, it, and it seems like in the last year I've written a lot, you know, but, um, also I write normally in the morning, you know, I try and set like a couple hours aside and, mm work and then, but normally I have like three things I'm doing at the same time. So yeah. like I have to write a bit of this and I have to write a bit of that and then I have to edit and then I have to look at visual effects and then I have to whatever. So hmm. it's it's I really I would love to write something I haven't had this opportunity, but I would love to write something where I get to just like where I say to Debbie like, okay, I'm gonna go to a cabin in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> For like two weeks, I'm just gonna write something and bring it back. That would be cool. I just like that idea. I just I don't see it happening because I think I'm gonna do that. But I think that would be cool. I think make, I sure, make sure you read Misery before you do that. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Good, point. Good point. Yeah. You know, to that That's end. That's how it up to me, by the way. <laughs> Uh, to that end, I mean, when we talk about your, um, you know, what you're putting into a script, I mean, one of the things I've always loved about your filmmaking is that you're always exploring all this like social commentary and themes. And and to me, that's the stuff that makes me think about a film, you know, for years on end. Like I constantly think about a lot of your past films because of, of all the the challenging things that you've brought forward into the into your storytelling. And what what can we expect from Army of the Dead here? Do you have some stuff that you're particularly proud of? Yeah, Army has. Yeah, um, it's funny because I've been doing a lot of press. And all the reporters have seen the movie, mm. and so it's okay. like I, I'm always like, oh, and then remember the part where I did that, and they're like, oh yeah, and I was like, okay, see, yeah. um, and I think that, and and this movie is chock a block of social commentary. Um, it, we really, to me, one of the main, also one of the big tropes of the the genre, zombie genre is that it talks about us as a species as well, right? Mm -hmm. It kind of um, you know, and just setting the movie in Las Vegas already like <laughs> calls, uh, you know, calls us out a little bit, you know. Does, yeah. uh, and I think that, um, and there's a big, there was a big political part of it because what we didn't realize when we were making the movie and we thought was hilarious is that a plague, a zombie plague or a plague of any kind could be politicized, you know. Right. We didn't think that, we thought that was funny, like that would never happen. Like in real life, <laughs> and so uh, it's just a really interesting little aspect of the movie. We, um, I got Sean Spicer and Donna Brazil, um, and there, and there's a, like at one point, um, Dave's watching a, um, a kind of a these two pundits on a TV show talking about uh, the political response to uh, to the to the zombie. To the zombie plague and how like there's like these refugee camps that have been set up to um and basically donna brazil says like you know if you have like questionable immigration status you know if you advocate for gay rights or abortion they point a temperature gun at your head and they say and then they put you and they say you have the zombie virus and they put you in this like you know whatever you know so it's it's, it's a really it, it, you know we thought that was like a really interesting um kind of like uh just fun thing to play with sort of as a as a um as a commentary and then it was just and it's, it's an interesting thing and we, and we can talk about it after the movie comes out mm -hmm. just analyzing the reality of kind of how that has played out you know in, in recent with this recent reality yeah. Um, and just in this, because we made the movie, we had no idea like there was going to be this lockdown or anything like that. We were, you know, and we have a bunch of, you know, there's a big part of it is, you know, they, the difference is if you're, if your temperature falls. Um, oh, all right. Yeah. That's, that's how we play <laughs> yeah. it. You're yeah. down a couple 
degrees <laughs> as opposed to up, that's a bad, that's a bad sign. Like that, <laughs> that's one of the symptoms of your, that you that you have, you, that you could become a zombie is that you, your temperature falls. Um, mm. And so, you know, we see that, you know, where he's like, ah, oh, it looks like you're down a couple decimal points. You know, that's not good. <laughs> you, know. <laughs> you know, they're going to criticize you for being a little bit too on the nose with all these themes. I, look, I and like, it was all done beforehand. I, like, all I'll say is it was all done before. <laughs> <laughs> You had talked about, and I always love the idea that not only is this a zombie movie, it's also a heist movie. And yeah. you being such the film buff that you are, I know your your DC films are filled with Excalibur and Seven Samurai homages. Wow. And you even mentioned earlier during this panel about uh, Aliens, The Thing, Planet of the Apes, Escape from New York, and just how there are influences and homages. So I'm kind of curious about what might have been some heist movies in particular that maybe had an influence or maybe you snuck in a little homage here or there in our Yeah, movie. I mean, the ones that have really gotten me are like Italian Job and uh, Thunderbolt and Lightfoot and, um, of course, Oceans. I mean, look, you can't make a zombie heist film set in Vegas or a, a heist film set in Vegas yes. and not have some uh, Oceans reference. It would just be... Right especially in a movie that's making other movie references. Like mm -hmm. it just doesn't make any, I mean, and it's subtle and we try not to like, you know, go completely nuts, but it just, it is what it is. Like, I can't, I'm sorry. It just, you know, don't, yeah. don't, don't kill the messenger. It's funny though. I was watching um, the uh, Rick and Morty. Um, I think it, the one flew over the cuckoo's nest or whatever it's called. There's that one uh, Rick and Morty episode about uh, the heist, the heist, um, the heist sort of send up and uh, you know, they have to make the crew and all that. Yeah. You know, son of a bitch. I'm in. It's that one. Uh, <laughs> and it's so like, and we were, I was just laughing. I'm like, that's my movie right there. Like, oh man. <laughs> Oh, that makes me so happy because I have to admit, yeah, I saw a moment in the trailer and I was like, dude, that's so Ocean's Eleven. That makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. But which one? Uh, well, it made me think about like when the when the casino owner is bringing them all together and he like pulls oh, yeah. the sheet off right. and he's yeah. got the he's got the model he's like, and it's under the strip and I'm like, dude, yeah. this is Ocean's Eleven. I love yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's That's funny right. because like when Shane and I were writing that scene, I was like, oh, so then we're gonna have like a scene where they're in a warehouse and they're like they have a model and they're like we see the store, we see the plan. Yeah. You know, that's got to be like. You know, that's got to be part of it. You know, it's kind of like a weird, you know, they've all got their cars parked in a warehouse. It's like, you know, it's how you would do it. Right. right like that right. seems like, I mean, I don't know how else you would. Explain. I think there was a, there was a time when I had to do this. I had this, I think I had this idea that they were going to have like um, the super complicated, like he was going to have like a movie projector and like, he, like, or like a slideshow that he had prepared. So that it was like all projecting on him mm -hmm. and this super multimedia like presentation because you know he's he's a billionaire so mm -hmm. and then i was like no models better <laughs> <laughs> oh awesome yeah, so zach i have a technical question for you so this is the first film as far as i know um that you've done as a full feature uh using a digital uh camera true so and so i mean i know you you obviously you know you're a big fan of a celluloid and you know yeah. and, I, and i remember seeing um a great documentary side by side uh, uh, it was um, narrated by, well, it was actually hosted by Keanu Reeves. And it was just a great thing about the, the debate between celluloid and, and uh, digital. And um, and I, I kind of feel like, you know, the technology has gotten to a point where that, that gap is is not there as much. And I'm just kind of curious about what your thoughts are now that you've done a, a full film and some of the advantages and disadvantages of it. Wh where's your head at right now on this? Would I... Um... Would I want to go back and shoot a movie on film again? I, I would. I would. I would consider it. But I have had such a good um, the, these red cameras that mm -hmm. Jared gave me, um, and that I listen. I was messing around with this notion, and I, I think I've talked about this before. But I was right, messing around with this notion of I was getting ready. We were talking about doing last photograph or or, or horse latitudes, and um, I was like, okay, we're going to be in this like we're going to end up in like Bolivia shooting this movie. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a super small crew. Cause I want to do it, you know, just me, you know? So like, so I was like, I just need to be like, 
you know, mm. like this. I don't, I need nothing but this, right? And so Jared was like, okay, here, here's a camera. This, this is the actual camera. This is the one that he gave me. He was like, okay, here, take this and go mess around with it, right? Mm. And so I had this idea of like, okay, well, I did a little experiment where I said, okay, can I shoot, edit, and color? And, and can I shoot and edit a uh, like little 10 minute piece? It's just shot around the house um, myself, by myself, uh, you know, with no, just me in the camera. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, of course I can't. Um, the film version is much harder, right? Because you got to process the film. Mm -hmm. You've got, there's a lot of things you got to do. Um, and you get a lot of benefit from that because you have this kind of like organic experience. Now, what happened was in that process, that's when I started really thinking about the lensing really hard because uh, the lensing, I think, is the real, is, for me, has become like the real sort of, it allows me to use these cameras because it, I think the organic, I still have kept a lot of the organic flaws or, mm -hmm. or, or happy accidents of um, shooting on film in, in, the, um, in, in this process by, by choosing lenses that offer a lot of organic, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. just, just Artifacts. stuff that you can touch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that process has been uh, really a giant rabbit hole that I've gone down. And, and you know, every free moment I have, I'm like messing around and screwing around with these lenses and, and reworking them and rebuilding them and taking them apart. And having, I have this amazing, um, this guy, Alex, over at Zero Optic, who he's exhausted by me at this point because all I want to do is like, Oh, you know what? What if we take it apart and we put this piece of glass in and then we mm -hmm. change the front element and he's like, all right, fuck. you know, he's like, <laughs> starts doing it again, but he's excited. You know, he's a, he's a lens geek. So he'll go like, yeah. well, what if we did this? And I'll be like, yes. And so, um, that process has been really good. And I think when you look at army, you can really see it's got a very mm -hmm. unique sort of photographic quality to it. And that that's really come from, all of that work that we did together to kind of to kind of get to this place where, and, and the movie. I, I look. I don't know if you know anything about photography, but um, those Canon lenses that we shot the movie with. Um, I'm looking around because I know I have them right here somewhere. Um, they are they open to a, um, a 0.95, right? Yeah, that's like, small. <laughs> really, really wide open. I mean, as wide open as you can possibly. Yeah. It's like, you know. And I had an amazing team of camera assistants and focus pullers. And the movie is way more in focus than I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. I thought the movie was going to be completely out of focus. Um, but I was kind of ready to, I was like, well, that's the movie. It's going to be out of focus. <laughs> but um, those guys did a really great job. And, and it was just incredible. And like the way the, the, the lenses flare and just everything about them is just amazingly unique. And so I had a really great, a really great time messing around yeah. with them and kind of building this this arsenal of, of sort of photographic um, tools. And it's been great. And I really love the cameras. And it's a giant sensor. These, these are 8K cameras. Uh, we, shoot, we shot everything. The movie's not 8K mm -hmm. in release, but we shot the full the oh, wow. full range. And, and we, you know, you have to keep down resing it until you get to the right, yeah. you can broadcast it, you know. <laughs> um, Future proofed. Yeah. Yeah, but um, really, really, really love the cameras, and and I'm a, uh, you know, I, I'm a what do you call it? I'm a, I'm devoted to to these cameras, uh, mm. and I, I've been, um, and, and I just couldn't, and you know, and, and I think Jared has been, and Red itself has been a huge supporter of mine. You know, like I, mm. I was in a place where after I left Justice League, where I wasn't even like I was kind of not in the movies. I was kind of like you know, mm -hmm. right. just sort of dealing with the, with the stuff that we had in our family and just the, the stuff we were going through. And Jared really like, you know, showed up with his camera and said, like, hey, you know, you should make a movie. <laughs> and I think it was a big, it really, you know, you know, and for that, I'm, I'm just grateful to him. And, and it, mm -hmm. it really got me kind of excited about making movies because, you know, I was just, I was just walking around the house kind of filming stuff on my own. <laughs> and uh, it just kind of got me excited. I did. It was funny because I, I, you know, 
when I started to get that idea, I shot snow steam iron right, right yeah. around that. Um, and that was kind of more of that experiment, you know, that right. was part of me experimenting was doing that little thing on my phone, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and, you know, I talked to Sam about, we, we've talked a lot about doing a little sequel to that, but I don't know when, maybe yeah. I'll do that. I, I, I'd like to awesome. do that. Well, maybe I'll shoot with this so you know we a big thank you goes out today to to Netflix because I mean they mm-hmm. they greenlit the movie they mm-hmm. they've they've made a lot of stuff today on just as con possible right so how would you characterize your experience working with Netflix as a studio and as creative partners in general through this whole process? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Netflix has been beyond amazing and in the sense that they have been real. Um, they've leaned into uh, all of the insanity that we have been um, sort of asking or, or saying that we think is cool mm-hmm. and that we think, you know, audiences will enjoy. And it's just they're, they're going to they're gonna, it feels like a familiar thing, but when they actually get in it, they're going to be like, holy smokes, I have no idea where this movie's going. Um, and I think that they they appreciated all that. And even just, you know, me as a filmmaker and as a, and you know, as a cinematographer have been nothing but supportive and incredibly, um, actually, if anything, encouraging to like go further, do more, you know, and I think that that uh, has been priceless and I couldn't, I couldn't ask for a better relationship with my partners and my studio. And mm-hmm. um, it really just makes me want them, you know, to make them a ton of movies that are like so successful that they can't mm-hmm. believe. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. I mean, so, I mean, I grew up loving the theatrical experience and I've kind of found yeah. myself. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, that's fine. And I and as I found I've gotten older, you know, especially with raising a family and all that, like it's it's more difficult for me to actually get out. Um, surprisingly, like it's it's not as easy on a whim. I could just go out and see a film. And so I usually have to kind of plan it out. And so I've actually found myself gravitating more towards the streaming model, which is just contrary to like everything I felt, you know, earlier in my life. And and I just kind of wonder, you know, like with it, with a theatrical model, and it seems how Cal Studios are kind of pushing more towards tent poles, and then and it, obviously it leads to a lot of constraints, which has affected some of your past films as well. Um, do you find yourself looking at a streaming model as maybe maybe your more preferred, you know, uh, method of distribution going forward? Well, I mean, you know, again, I haven't thought about it in those terms, like really, like okay, I'm like a streamer, <laughs> that's what I do, yeah. um, but. But I'll, but I'll be honest, you know, for me, the relationship I have with Netflix and the way they have, um, the way that they've treated me in relationship to, uh, as a storyteller and as a filmmaker, um, has been unique and very, uh, you know, artist forward. And I think that, um, in that way, it's hard to say that you'd be like, oh yeah, no, you know, I, I can't wait to go back and, and make a movie for the theater. Although I would say that the theater experience is unique and is mm-hmm. awesome. I mean, the, the, just say that they were like, okay, well, we're gonna put Army in the movie theaters for a week because we just think it's cool and it'd be great to do. Mm-hmm. You know, just that alone, I was like, okay. I, we didn't, I didn't expect that. I wasn't planning on that. They just said, we think the movie we think it'd be great for people to see it in the, in the theater. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay. And I think that's just another example of mm-hmm. them going, oh, we want to, we feel like this is about the experience, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's great for some people to see it on service as it, as it, as it will be seen. But they also said, well, and some people can go watch it in the theater, you know, because like they, they feel like, they feel like if you see it in the theater, you probably watch it again at, at, when you get home. Anyway, mm-hmm. you know? yeah, so, yeah. Um, I just think it's, I just think they're smart and I think that mm-hmm. they, they love movies too. You know, they're not, mm-hmm. they're not, they want people to enjoy films clearly. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. It's really, it's really fun. So of course that's going to be in select cities about May 14th. I'm just crossing my fingers that I'm one of the select cities. <laughs> it's like, I never get these things, but you know, <laughs> I, a man could dream. If you, if Where you are you? Birmingham, Alabama. 
Oh yeah, of course. Old Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Really. <laughs> they don't get down here. You know, but, yeah. Birmingham. <laughs> Everyone knows you got to release your movie there. Um, right. <laughs> But I, I was very curious because I remember the Hollywood Reporter article when we first found out that Army was a thing and it was happening out. And I'm just kind of curious, what's the story of Netflix finding out about Army and going, yes, that's that's a thing we want to do and we want to do it with you? Because mm -hmm. it's it's been around since 2007. So I'm just I just I, I would yeah. like to know like what that story is. The story is pretty. I mean, listen, I mean. In a nutshell, yes, Warner Brothers owned it. You know, they owned the rights to it because I had pitched it to Warner Brothers. You know, that's where it came from. You know, mm -hmm. it was a Warner Brothers movie. I was like, oh, I'm, I'll make it with you guys. We couldn't figure it out. Like they couldn't, like for whatever reason, um, whether it be the budget or just like the appetite, it was just like, it yeah. just we just couldn't figure it out. Um, and, uh, you know, I was just, I, I was just, you know, I know Scott, um, he, he was my executive on Dawn of the Dead and, mm -hmm. you know, I had a meeting down there at Netflix just to talk about like, what am I might, am I interested in making a movie? Like, are we, are we, are we making a movie? Uh, you're like, you're like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, you know, maybe like, and it's like, what do you, what do you, what do you want to do? Like, what do you got? And I was like, well, I don't know. I, there's this cool zombie thing, which, you know, that I came up with a lot a while ago about this zombie plague it's vegas they wall the city we have to get these like veteran zombie hunters and they're gonna pay them all this money to go in and get the a safe that's under the strip and they gotta just fight their way through all these zombies and they were like okay yes let's do that <laughs> you know it wasn't like a big uh it just felt and and, I, and and frankly i think that's why that idea has been around for so long it's just like it sounds like a movie idea you know, like when you say it out loud, it seems like, OK, where, where do I watch that movie? Um, and I think that and, and that's kind of literally how it happened. You know, Scott was just like, yeah, that sounds cool. Do you want to do that? And I was like, yeah, I did want to do it. Mm -hmm. And then I think the part of it was, like I said, if I did it, I kind of want to write it from scratch because we do have a script. But I, I'd love to sort of sort of just almost do it from memory, you know, like the way I imagine it. I know that's, I haven't read the script in like five years. So instead of looking at it, I think I'll just, I'll just sit with Shay and we'll just, I'll just go and then we'll do this and then that. And I think, you know what I mean? And that's kind of how we did it. Mm. Okay. And then they, and they were, and they, it, it was a quick process. I mean, it's funny, you know, we've had to do the reshoots, you know, with TIG and that kind of kicked the ball further down, but the movie was, has been done for a while. Yeah. You know, you, know, you mentioned those reshoots. How tough was that? Because you you had to film. Um, uh, I'm trying to blank on her name, but you had to film her uh, just by herself. Yeah, Tig. Yeah, yeah Tig. Well, yeah. Well, it was a really interesting thing because, sort of my, the, the the my philosophy in shooting was really raw. Like I just yeah. the the camera's wide open. It's like natural light i was always just like okay open that window and like put, point your flashlight at this piece of paper and put one small light over there okay we're ready and like everyone's like he's insane you know like that can't be all the lighting i'm like trust me it's gonna be fine um and so we would we so we shot this movie in this most raw and organic way you know that you can possibly imagine and then when we had to put tig in the movie it was the most technical exercise that you could pop. So I'm recreating that exact setup now on stage, instead of being like on location where it's all like, oh, just organic, like open that door, that's the backlight, fuck it. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm just going, that. now I'm on stage going like, okay, I think we need to do, we should have a 2K there. And then like, you know, it's this incredibly crazy, exacting, nearly motion control, redo of the same shot that we just were running and gunning to get. Yeah. So it was like this double exercise. It turned into this insane exercise in, in matching, you know? Mm. Um, and it came out great. I mean, Tig is literally went right into the movie and, yeah, and she's, and she's a genius. <laughs> and she, I, I love her in the movie and I love her in general, but I love her in the movie and um, she's just great. And she really just, 
she, she just, she was a sport. It's 15 days to get her in the movie. It's not a short amount of time, you know, like, yeah. and, and every shot's her. Like, you know, yeah. like, okay, now you're out of focus in the foreground because I'm shooting, because the shot was your, yeah. just like a piece of you, like the edge of your head right here. And then that's green screen back there, but those tennis balls are the other actors, you know. <laughs> you're, you're telling her just to turn just a little bit. And yeah, like, okay, yeah. I like that now. Let's make her out of focus. Okay, that's yeah. perfect. <laughs> Not just kind of like you're listening, you know, <laughs> but you know, like you don't realize like when yeah. you're doing stick ensemble and you're shooting it organically and, you know, we're replacing another actor. So wherever they were, Teague would have to be. And if they're just wandering around on the set, like they end up like out of focus way over there or way in the foreground over here, you know, and then you're like, holy, sh and then when you analyze it, and you're like, holy shit, it's all these shots. It's like <laughs> hundreds of shots, you know, where they're just happen to be there as well as the ones where they're actually acting and it's their scene. Yes, yeah. of course there's that, but then there's just countless other ones where they're just like, you know, back there listening or looking around or whatever, you know, and you realize when you do a big ensemble they're, and they're all in there, you know, it's just, it, it adds up and, uh, but she did an amazing job and she was super right. patient with me, you know, cause it was very technical. But then the great thing about Tig is that, you know, she has a, such a certain, you know, and particular cadence and way of being that um, she really made every moment that she's in just special and incredible. And, and, and also just the moments in between, just cause she was there with me on, on set shooting. So she would just, you know, mm -hmm. crack me up the entire time. So it was, it was <laughs> She lives uh, rent-free in my head from the trailer. Just that scene of her with her aviators, <laughs> smoking a cigarette, pouring gasoline. Pouring and I'm just there going, that is a badass shot. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's perfect. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, she was the one that was like, what about a cigarette? And I was like, <laughs> yes. Why, why? Okay. Yeah, why not? <laughs> you know, and also... We had to add all that smoke is all digital, you know, because you can't yeah. smoke. So it's, right. It's just like everything, you know, it's all just fun. Oh, that's fantastic. Hey, I just want to remind everyone. Uh, so, you know, this this um, this convention is is helping to uh, raise money for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention as well. So you can go down to the bottom of the link in the video right now and you can go ahead and and uh, and help contribute to this cause. I mean, it's such an important cause. Uh, I think all of us, uh, especially during this past year, you know, we understand just how much strain has been put on us. And so, um, uh, like I said, you know, if you if you're able to help support uh, and I know we're going to bring in Meg here in just a little bit and she's going to give us a little update on what our total is right now. But just yeah, I mean, in the meantime, I mean, we just really got to figure out how to get Dave Batista to be Bane. Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it just feels like, I feel like I feel like I mean, I saw him and I was like, I saw him talking about it and I was like, OK, well, clearly. You know, I had some other ideas about what Batista <laughs> might do in the DC universe, but apparently I, I, it's Dan. I, I loved how you talk about other ones. There's other possibilities, <laughs> but let's just all accept the fact that he's got to be Bane, and there's no two ways about it. <laughs> let's make it happen. So yeah. hashtag it, hashtag it, everybody. Well, and, <laughs> and it's amazing to me that the movie isn't even out yet. And you already have franchise projects already busting out. So what what with Las Vegas, the anime series and the yeah. and Army of Thieves, like what would you like to like can you tease us anything? Like what is it like to already have like all these projects and the the kickoff hasn't even released yet? It's exciting. And, and look, frankly, it's just it goes back to what I was saying about Netflix being so they love the movie, they love the universe. Um the, the just the kind of this world that we've created and these zombies and their mythology and like where they come from, which is a mind bender anyway, when you actually see it. I mean, it's not in the movie a hundred percent. It's implied in the movie, but mm -hmm. in the animated series, we actually go and, and we, and we go all the way. I don't think it ruins anything to say area 51 is involved. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, as, as of course it is, uh, you know, when you say it out loud, you're like, I guess the zombies do come from Area 51. Wouldn't that make It's not sense? too far away. It's yeah. Vegas. I mean, seriously. It's right, right there. there. Yes, <laughs> it's right there. Why would you like, you know, 
Why would they put Las Vegas so close to Area 51? That feels like a mistake. <laughs> it's all yeah, yeah, exactly. Really? Really? Oh, it's a, that's a coincidence. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, um, yeah, and there's a lot of fun. I can't wait for people to see the movie. And there's so many sort of – there's so many Easter eggs and, like, little things that I'm always pushing at them that I, that I can't wait for everyone to, like, want to – because this conversation after you've seen the movie is going to be really rich uh, because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of stuff to, oh, to talk can't about. Wait. So yes, so uh, Matthias has done his Army of Thieves in Germany. We shot it during COVID. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing like it basically tells the story of um, of uh, his 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 involvement with the different. Okay, so. The safe is mm -hmm. called the Gotterdammerung, which oh, is, wow. you know, yeah. Twilight of the Gods. Yeah. Twilight yeah. of the Gods. <laughs> yes. And what we learn in the other movie is that, um, that this movie, uh, that this, that the safes were built by this famous safe builder who's, who's, who, whose last name is Wagner, but not a different Wagner. Oh, and who, and who, <laughs> I love and it who already. Has, <laughs> and who has built, all over the world, he built four safes, four different safes that coincide with the different um, chapters of the ring, ring cycle. And, okay. and, and, you know, like, and so he's yeah. been obsessed his whole life with these safes. And, and he's taught himself to be a safe cracker because he's in love with just the mechanisms, the puzzle of these safes that Wagner created like years ago. And, one of the safes, the final one, the Gotterdammerung, he doesn't know where it is, right? So, like, we see this whole movie where it's like a, it's a love story and it's like a, um, it's a romantic comedy and it's a heist movie, but it's all about these safes. And um, let's just say that the Gotterdammerung, you know, is the Holy Grail. And mm -hmm. uh, that's the name, that's the safe that, that Bly has, you know. Oh. So, oh, I love so it. It's rich. It's rich and it's really fun. And it's kind of um, it, it it's kind of one of those super, super fun and crazy. Um, you know, the way it meshes up is really hilarious. And he did a great he directed the movie and he did a great job. Who wrote the script on it? Shay wrote the script. They did. OK. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> That's awesome. A lot. And it's in German, French and English. It's like this cool. It's like it's like a James Bond movie in a weird way. Well, and that's what I love about this, too, because it's it's this whole idea of like, you know, let's just be a lot more international. And like you've, yeah, certainly, yeah. Had that, you've certainly had that mindset. And we just talked about the last film that we just saw of yours, uh, Zack Snyder's Justice League. I mean, you had this intention um, with one of the characters to be, a, you know, a, a, a Ryan Choi to be a Chinese, you know, character that you could make a film out of. And, yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I love the fact that you're doing this. Yeah. Yeah. And like in half in English and half in Chinese. And I think that like and I and I think that Netflix they really understand that. And like people have no problem watching a movie that has, you know, some French in it and yeah. some English and like, you know, it's incredible. You know, the movie, like a show like money heist is so huge mm -hmm. and it's like, you know, in Spanish and you just mm -hmm. like, it's fine. Like, I don't care. I just want to enjoy it. You know, like those kinds of things. I think Netflix understands even it, it's it's every day we we come closer and closer to this kind of global model where we're just making and enjoying everyone's movies from all over the world mm -hmm. and they're available to us and you know all the stars from all the different worlds are like all the different countries are all like intermingling and we're making right. movies you know with with you know all the and and it's great and I and then we, we did it with Army and it worked out amazing and, and like these Fantastic. people are amazing I mean if you saw the girls earlier the ladies yeah, yeah yeah they're all every single one of them is a stone cold genius and i was lucky to have them and they just made my movie amazing and um yeah they're just great i mean nora does an amazing job in the movie mm -hmm. he has this really complicated role where i mean because the implication is that the that the uh quarantine camp that's built on the outside of the wall uh uh, in Vegas, because they've evacuated that whole area. Everyone's mm -hmm. fallen back like 100 miles away from Nevada. And they're in this <laughs> zone that we we call like it's it's where constitutional law has been suspended within this zone where the zombies yeah. are because it allows, you know, 
because there's a lot of there would be a lot of problems let's say mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. in controlling right. the plague if we had to also worry about people's rights you know yeah. um, right. <laughs> rights of course that's another exhausting. great parallel yeah and so we um you know and so that's where the camp is this refugee camp and it is and there's a lot of foreigners there because you know when we were making the movie there was a lot of kind of um you know immigrants being kind of and and it happens all over the world every day where people that are fleeing from some political um issue in their country or whatever it is they all get herded together into right. like you know into a refugee camp and and so we decided to make or i did um this uh this this uh quarantine camp where no one's had the zombie plague in years you know and no, and it's a pretty quick if you have it you know it's not like uh a situation where like we're just going to keep our eye on you it, it literally if you have it you turn into a zombie pretty fast mm-hmm. um and so you know you might you might depending on how badly you've been bitten it might take a couple days or it might be an hour depending on how how you know how bad the wound is you know that's like another thing we play with that with that trope a lot yeah. you know, like depending on how badly you know and by who you were bitten the and who you are it either hits you immediately or, or if you have another injury, you know, like you might be, cause pretty much the bite doesn't kill you right away. But mm-hmm. if you've been shot or you've, something's happened to you, then like, you know, you turn faster. I mean, it's obvious, but <laughs> yeah. you know, these are just, these are zombie things we think about. Um, yeah. But anyway, so in that camp, there's a lot of, you know, international, um, there's a lot of immigrants, you know, or people that are there, you know, um, because maybe they're they're mistaken or the other or whatever, and so you know that's what. We're, and so Nora, she her job in the in the camp is to she's they call her the coyote. She goes she's there's like a tunnel or a way through the um, containers, and she'll take you in to Vegas, and you could crack a slot machine and sneak out and pay some guards and get out, you know? Mm. So there's like, uh, there's a way, if you're willing to risk it, you know, to go and, um, you know, if you're quiet, you know, you can get in and out, but if you go too deep, you know, well, that's another thing entirely, but, but, it, but so Nora has, she's kind of our, she's kind of the, she's the, she's explaining a lot of the culture inside of the wall because she's seen it firsthand. So that's why she's kind of the one saying they're not what you think they are they're faster. They're strong. Like she's seen them. She knows how to like, you know, deal with them. Mm-hmm. So it's really fun. So she's had, a, she had a huge, she has a huge arc kind of in the movie. It's really, it's really fun. Oh, can't wait. <laughs> yeah. Can't wait. And then Huma is amazing as well. And Huma has this yeah. like, you know, and she's, She's like, you know, I, I won't tell her story because I'll let her see it in the movie. But, you know, she's also stuck in the camp, you know. Mm. But, uh, yeah, they were really, but but just amazing people to work with and all, and all really, um, you know, they had to, like, learn how to fight. And they have, like, this incredible drama that they've got to throw to them. They've got to make those zombies believable because, let's be frank, the zombies are only as believable as the reaction that people have to them you know what i mean so, right <laughs> you know the actors let you know how real the zombies are you know? mm-hmm. so that's fun that's awesome uh so i was gonna see if we could bring in meg i don't know if meg if you're ready just you know pop yourself in i'd like to get an update on afsp hey just pop yourself hey. in <laughs> oh, yeah <laughs> Hey guys. Um, okay, she's so, in control of the show because she can just oh, yeah. tell me why she plays. Yeah, it's obvious. <laughs> um, our total right making, now. You were making your face from yesterday. It was supposed to be the face you make when you get your picture taken, but oh, it yeah, actually the... means you're you're up to something. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> she's always up to something. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so the total for AFSP right now is fourteen thousand four hundred and thirty-two dollars. And if we get to the uh, fifteen thousand dollar mark, the fandom will actually be at seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars raised as a total. Oh. Um, so it would be really awesome if we could hit that. Um, 
that mark right now. Well, I mean, clearly we have because <laughs> if no one else calls in. I'll just make it up. So let's just call it. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> we'll just call it there. Yeah. That's um, just astounding. I have some some really great fan questions from the chat, um, but this one comes from Twitter. Uh, Chris Dawson uh, asks. Is it about Bing? Um, it, it's not. <laughs> it's not. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, you use the Dream Lens in, in Zack Snyder's Justice League as well as Army of the Dead. Mm-hmm. Um, what were the challenges of working with that? It's, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, um, it's challenging for visual effects because they've got to map the lenses. In a lot of ways, we had more experience on on Army than we did on Justice League mapping the lenses. I mean, they did a great job. Weta did it. Mm-hmm. Weta had to work with them. They did that did that scene in Justice League. Um, but um, the dream lenses, when we used them on Army, uh, Marcus had the you know he had a whole giant movie to to figure <laughs> out. You know, not just one scene. Um, so yeah, and the challenges are. I mean, literally, the challenges are mostly self-imposed by me um, because <laughs> I really like to shoot the lenses wide open. And so they tend to, um, they tend to, uh, here's a flick there. I'm going to grab one. Um, they tend to, uh, they tend to be really not super sharp. Um, I mean, they are sharp where they're sharp, but they're not sharp where they're not. Obviously. <laughs> um, obviously. So, yeah. so this is it just on my, on my Leica and they're M mounted. So you can see they can fit onto my camera. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And then they have all sorts of like cryptic Easter eggs all over them. Um, of course because, I do. I, because I can't just, make it. <laughs> <laughs> you just can't help yourself. Oh, this one's called the Valkyrie. Obviously. Oh, oh that's um, so cool. cool. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, all the lenses yeah. have their own names. Um, okay. So yeah. So they're also a fetish item um, at some point. Uh, yeah. But yeah, really cool. I have a whole box. There's three of each. There's three 50 mils and three 35s. And okay. um, yeah. But uh, yes. So the way we worked with them, though, we were um, basically uh, uh, the lenses had to be mapped and all their like chromatic aberrations had to be figured out and how they worked. And, and they're all, every single one of them is slightly different. They have this, they grow this little bit of um, fungus inside of them because they, they were made in the 60s. So um, we analyzed the different fungus in the different lenses. And um, yeah, it really, it was, it's fun. I mean, I, I know it sounds dorky, but it's, 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 <laughs> no, it's not dorky. You remember who you're talking to, right? Yeah, right. I mean. <laughs> Seriously. <Yeah. laughs> um, Aaron Vargas asks, uh, what was your method to shooting the action for Army of the Dead compared to Dawn of the Dead, your DC film, Sucker Punch and 300? Um, well, Damon Caro did all the fight choreography and was the second unit director. Um, we shot um, pretty much all the casino battle and we shot all that together. He did a lot of um, uh, the Sam Wynn You'll see there's an amazing scene with Sam where she's fighting through this kitchen. They did that together um, mm. while we were shooting something else. Um, but the action, I mean, it was kind of, you know, I like I like working with Damon and, and he and I have a really great time and it's just fun. Um, even if you've seen like uh, just, I guess our approach to action is kind of the same. Mm-hmm. You know, even though like the style might be a little different, it's always, you know, for us, we're always just like, wouldn't it be cool if, you know, and then we start <laughs> literally two idiot dorks just trying to figure out like, you know, we're just yeah. like, okay, so then he's gonna run on the tables and he's firing at the zombies. They're like diving all over the place. And then the cool thing with Dave was like, he would, we got a couple, not a ton, but like there was a couple like uh, wrestling moves that we threw in, not a ton. <laughs> Just enough that I thought it was cool. Like I was oh. like, you know, because we—he's a shorter cook, not a, you know, right. not a wrestler. So, but it, just just to say that he could have had another career. <laughs> 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 Talking about the character, not Dave. Dave is Bane. 
We know that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's his career. Um, I have a question from John. He asks, um, are there any one track shots or similar shots to your 300 speed, uh, 300 ramp up shot? The Leonidas solo? Yeah. Is that what he's talking about? No. Yeah. We didn't do anything quite like that. You know, and that was a very tricky, weird shot anyway. I mean, I had done that shot. I had done a Gatorade commercial. I don't know if you know the story. Maybe I've told the story or not. Anyway, I'd done a Gatorade commercial in uh, in Mexico City. I think we shot it. And um, the uh, the idea for the commercial was these one shots where you see the moment, um, like the guy's running and he jumps for a baseball and we go and see the ball, like just getting his, like he's robbing a home run. And then we, and they had pitched it like with zooms. So kind of crazy zooms. And, and I was like, that's really going to be hard. Right. <laughs> to like, the, Oh, and they said like, and they hadn't pitched that slow-mo. And I go, what if it's like super high speed? So when he jumps up, we zoom, like we'll zoom in and then zoom out in the same shot, you know, but we'll, and we'll ramp to like super slow motion when he catches it. And they were like, cool. And I was like, and I got the job, but I had no idea how I was going to do it. Um, <laughs> so that's where I developed the idea. So I did, I had heard of this thing. I think it was called the horseman rig. Uh, it's been a while, 300 was a while ago. Basically the way it worked was, <laughs> so you have, um, so you have two cameras shooting through a prism, right? So you have a beam splitter and it's basically also did this on justice league for the 363 dolly around the mother box mm -hmm. when they're talking. So basically we had two cameras, one shoots straight ahead. Then you have a beam splitter right in front of the camera. And then you mount a second camera shooting into the mirror. So it's like, you know, a beam splitter is a mirror that is photographic quality. So you can, you can shoot through it. It's one way glass and you can shoot the reflection as well. And so you have, wow. so now basically you have two angles from the exact same perspective, right? Because oh, wow. you line the lens up so that it's, it's exactly shooting from here, but this lens, this one's wider and this one's tighter. So now you have two shots of the exact same thing shot in the exact same moment, but one's wider and one's tighter. And so then what we did with the third camera, we had, because I wanted three sizes, a super wide lens, which we put on like a snorkel and we stat it right on top of the beam splitter so that it was just out of frame. And so you could actually fudge it because this one's wide enough to get to the second wide one and kind of in the pullback, you can kind of, you fudge to the other lens. There's a little bit of, but the tight ones, you couldn't do it because you'd see this kind of, you'd see the perspective change. So we built this big rig, three cameras, all on this giant, ridiculous rig. And I, that's what I shot the Gatorade commercial with. And then we went with, and I made 300 right after that. And I said, oh, I know how we're going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the perfect idea. Yeah, I mean, we'll just like, build this crazy thing. And I think actually we had to shoot it twice because the first time we shot it, the um, because we shot it with Photosonics camera and Photosonics camera, because we didn't have digital high speed cameras in those days. The Photosonics camera is so big, it vibrated the glass of the oh, wow. So the second angle was like out of focus because it was vibrating the glass. So then we had to shoot it again. We had to figure out how to dampen the vibration off the off the beam splitter. But mm. so um, we did do that for Army because it's a handheld movie. And I didn't want to like yeah. I'm not a crazy person. I'm not gonna I mean that's a cool idea. <laughs> are, like, you sure? are you sure? Are you sure? I just sure. build a rig where it's handheld, but the second camera is attached to this one. And I oh, wow. Know. So, so Zach, I mean, did you do anything new in this film? Did you have any new experiments? Yeah, I, I feel like the whole photography was an experiment. Okay. You know, okay. The, the, the general way we shot the movie was an experiment. Okay. Like every shot, you know, because I was literally just a madman for shooting the movie completely wide open with no mm. stop on the lens ever. Mm. I think we shot because they were building the lenses when we were shooting. So the first couple of days we shot, they sent us out a prototype of this lens that had no irises in it at all. And so you couldn't change the aperture because there was no aperture in it because I needed it right away. Mm -hmm. And they were like, we can get you the lens, but it has no, it'll have no 
Iris. And I go, I don't care. <laughs> and they were like, you're insane. And it was, so it was, it was <laughs> and that's when my, I think that's when my um, assistants all knew I wasn't kidding about shooting the movie wide open because there was no stop to be able to be put on the lens anyway. So I, they were like, I guess you're serious about this. <laughs> yeah. So it's fun. Um, I don't want to interrupt you guys, but we did hit the $15,000 mark. Woo! Woo! I know. That's <laughs> over. That At oh. 700. Uh, yeah. So the total for Justice Con, we've raised uh, $15,000. The total puts us at the $750,000 mark. $750,000 US dollars? Yeah. Come on. All right. So the goal will be now, there's a new goal. Mm -hmm. So when we all meet up in October, when we're going to meet up, We'll be celebrating a million dollars, probably. I think so. And that will be so. that's a why to get together. Yes. And we'll just have a, a big million dollar party <laughs> and watch these and watch Justice League, mm -hmm. Man of Steel, and BBS and IMAX over yep. three days and go completely nuts. <laughs> Sounds like a party. Uh, All right, I'm ready. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll I'll bring the drinks. It's okay. <laughs> okay, I, I got I got this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say that there'll be like a adults section. Of the <laughs> I mean, the movie's R rated R, so right, <laughs> yeah. true. Parent or guardian, I guess it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I got my ID. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> what was okay? Here's my question for you guys. Do you remember the first R rated movie you ever saw? I do. I was. Uh, I snuck in. To, it's kind of embarrassing, but I snuck in to watch Dukes of Hazard with my friends. The one with like Johnny Knoxville yeah. and. Uh, I snuck into that at our local theater, which isn't here anymore. But um, yeah, I remember I, we snuck in to see that and I got grounded for like two <laughs> weeks after and that. Did you, and did you say like, man, this was worth it? No, I didn't at all. <laughs> uh, mine, if we're talking about the first R-rated Because I mean, movie. your first R-rated movie should be like kind of edgy, I would hope. Yeah, it was oh. Dukes of Hazzard. I mean, I live in a very small town, so like we didn't get many movies. So like that was like the one R-rated movie we finally. Anyway, and how old were you? I I was I think in like sixth grade. Hmm. So yeah. What is that? So that's about Eight. eleven. Yeah, eleven uh, or twelve. Yeah, 11, eleven. Eleven or twelve. 12. So that's <laughs> by the way respectable, Lee Young. You yes. Know? For sneaking up, <laughs> sneaking off into a movie at eleven. That's, I got to give you credit because that's, that's, <laughs> that's legit. Like you got grounded. Like you shouldn't be able to be going out at 11. So it's like being grounded at 11. Yeah. Like, I live in a really small, like our theater was like maybe like two blocks away from my parents' house. So. <laughs> oh. Okay, good. Yeah. If we're talking <laughs> about the first already movie I actually saw in theaters, uh, that would be Crimson Tide with Denzel Washington and Gene Hackman. Oh, that's a good movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love. I love a good submarine movie. I was thirteen. Yeah. Mm. And I honestly don't remember, but I think it might have been RoboCop, and I'm not even sure if that was yeah. rated R or not. That might have been. Oh, it was rated R. It oh, it was. Oh, it was rated R. RoboCop. I just didn't. I couldn't remember. Robo if, RoboCop. Oh, I couldn't remember if they had a rating R. system back then. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I know <laughs> it is. Directors cut of that movie's rated X. Just so <laughs> yes. You know. We've reviewed this, Tim. Come yeah. on, yeah. you should well, know just, this. But I, yeah. I know, but I've seen it later in life. I just can't remember if like if you know what if there was a rating system in place at the time. You know what you know how that was back then. So, oh, there was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mine that, was. Um, I think a Billy Jack movie called Born Losers. I think that's what it's called. Okay. Is it Born Losers? I think that's the name. Someone's gonna know. Someone's gonna. It was a Billy Jack movie though, I remember. You know Billy Jack. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the and uh I think it's called Born Losers. But anyway, it was a it was upsetting. I was way too young. I don't know how old I was. What year is it? Do you see it? 1967. It was made in 1967. Yes. There's no way I saw that movie. It. No, yeah. you didn't see it. I was you saw it later old. in life. I must have been like some sort of like retrospective when I was seeing it. There's a lot of holes in the story here, Zach. <laughs> Jesus. No wonder I'm jaded. <laughs> How did my parents take me when I was one years old to an R-rated movie? <laughs> really? Yeah. Maybe they thought I was asleep. You know? Maybe. And I was like, this is insane. <laughs> 
my dad tells a story about being a baby and being in a hotel room with me and him watching Blade Runner while I was asleep in the hotel room. So I think that just kind of that explains a lot about me right there. Yeah, <laughs> not everything. Yeah, I was uh, yeah, because I saw all those movies. My my parents stopped. I remember I saw my dad took me to Apocalypse Now on like Whoa, this wow. I was like, you know, I shouldn't have been seeing that, and I was like, this is yeah. ridiculous. And then of course, Excalibur was eighty one. Um, so hmm. yeah, that one I snuck into. Um, <laughs> heavy metal. I think I was certainly not old enough to see that in the theaters, but I loved it. Yeah, I was like. Robocop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's one of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah. It's all, yeah. all that jazz. So yeah, those movies all they really like they're upsetting <laughs> in a great way. But yeah. Just I will appreciate that you guys giving me that little bit of info. Yeah. Well, anything I else, Meg? Um, I do have one one more uh, fan question. Um, with the idea of the hierarchy of zombies, how will the idea of continuation be explored? Are the zombies aware of what what world they live in, and do they plan to keep ruling in Las Vegas? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. That is a uh, it's a bit of a spoiler, so I'm not going to say a hundred percent what their what their plan is. Um. But there is a plan, there's an overarching plan uh, that I have um, that I don't even know the zombies are 100% aware of, like where they fit in the ecosystem. But they do represent, I think, um, let's just put it this way. And I think this is true of zombies in general. And I think that we really, we're gonna, this is an idea that we're developing and you see it a little bit more in, in the army animated series. Um, the notion that the zombies might be like a better version of us a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. in regard to how they interact with the environment, environmental humans. Um, anyway, <laughs> so, yeah. so that might answer the question a little bit, but. Yeah, we can wait, we can wait. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, come on, at least your movie is coming out May 21st on Netflix and May 14th in theater. So it's not like we have that long to wait. No, you have that long. It's going to be here before you know it. And um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's good fun. And I, I can't, I can't, by the way, the, and, and I really can't wait for you guys to see the animated series because it's really, um, <laughs> there's some super crazy, <laughs> super crazy things. Like, I guess because I was like, it's an animated thing. So like. Fuck it. Let's just <laughs> do it. <laughs> you do anything. Why wouldn't you do this? And then like everyone's like, okay. Yeah. Hey, Netflix already did Love, Death, and Robots. I mean, there's there's not really a line in the sand anymore. I think we're oh. good. Yeah. And by the way, that show is pretty great. So <laughs> awesome. I think the next season is gonna be even crazier because they all just said, like, that worked. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I like when something like they take kind of a shot and it works, and everyone's like, "Oh, now let's just have a so yeah." Hey Zach, uh, if you go just one more hour with us, you can beat Jay Oliva's record. No, I don't even want to. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> I want Jay to have that record forever. Uh, he could have gone way longer. Which yeah, is, he's awesome. He's like, I do this stand on my head. I'll go through the night because you know he doesn't really sleep, so no, he can just like he it'd be like six a.m. and he'd be like, "Come on." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's doing like a he'd be like, oh, left, He'd just be on by himself. Yeah, like Jay will leave a telethon is what we need. No, yeah. yeah, that's cool. That's right. That's kind of what it is. I, I, up and check in with him. Yeah. <laughs> I told him uh, Justice Con day four, just one panel. Yes. <laughs> one panel oh, he should do like he should have some sort of weird like twenty four hour camera. Like you know, he's like one of those you know like those eagles when they give their when they give when they sit on their eggs and stuff. And you go and just check in. You just check in on the. Have you looked at the J cam? What is he doing today? You leave a, <laughs> oh, you leave a cam. I he's love not it. There. No, yeah, he's not there. He's not there. I think he's eating. <laughs> uh, the chair is just there. It's just like his <laughs> microphone in his chair. You know. That's fantastic. Uh, Can't wait to all see right, that. All right, guys. Well, oh, that's super fun. Thank you, guys. It's been uh, amazing, amazing weekend. You guys did an amazing job putting it together. I couldn't be happier. We're at 750 thousand dollars for suicide prevention and mental health yeah. awareness i don't know uh but this fandom is insane and 
couldn't I couldn't be prouder to be part of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and thank you guys for the amazing questions. And I can't wait for you to see Army of the Dead um, on Netflix and in theaters May twenty first on Netflix. And when is it in theaters? May fourteenth. May fourteenth. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Not in Birmingham, though. So like oh, the <laughs> yeah, no. If it's not in Birmingham, it's not in South Bend, Indiana. So stop it. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, it'd be cool if it's in South Bend and not in Birmingham. Be oh, awesome. it would be my you would never ever hear the end of that one. <laughs> Zach, if you've got a couple strings you can pull, I would oh, yeah. <laughs> that's cool. That's great. All right, you guys. Well, thank you so much. And uh, oh, yes. Oh, well, we will we'll, we will be closing out the stream here. Just wanted to say goodnight to everyone. Uh, Zach, could you hang on for a moment? For oh, yes, I will hang on. Okay. <laughs> Don't run away. You tend to do I won't run away. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So from the Nerd Queens and Wonder Meg and all of our helpers here at Justice Con, thank you guys so much for making today an absolute success. Yep. We have we are ending the day at fifteen thousand a hundred and four dollars. So thank yes. you so much, and we hope we can bring more amazing events to you guys in the future. I can't wait. I'm super excited. Yeah, 